over 50, You Are Not Done Yet is a podcast documenting the lives of Americans 50 and over. They are artists, musicians, performers, authors, teachers, and coaches. Their stories are your stories, their lives, their legacies, and the people they've touched are all inspiring. Listen as they open their hearts and share their passions. I work with disabilities, Mm -hmm. kids who have disabilities, and where systems have failed them. Mm -hmm. And I want to give back. I want to help a kid not have to experience the pain that I went through. I want them to know that there is a way to communicate Mm -hmm. in spite of that pain. Mm -hmm. I just want them to know their voice, their true voices. Today, I'm sitting down with artist, writer, and retired American Airlines employee, Mi Lin Yuk. This Blasian American shares her struggles being raised by a Chinese father, surviving the streets of Philadelphia, and her continued growth in the second half of her life. So grab some tea and let's begin. Growing up in Philly and back in the 60s probably wasn't that easy. Yeah, I would say that um, growing up in the 60s was uh, a very uh, challenging experience, to say the least, because um, being that I was uh, African-American Chinese, um, I had to deal with all kinds of uh, racial disparity uh, within my home um, and outside my home. When I was growing up, I was raised by my father, who was Chinese, and he was born in 1904. And he didn't have us until he was 54. He started making babies at 54. And uh, growing up, um, my mother, who was much younger than him, I'm not going to say how young, but let me just say... She was in her teenage years uh, Mm -hmm. when she first had me. Mm -hmm. And um, the relationship, I guess you would call it, what is it, a fall, a summer, fall relationship. And it just didn't work. Um, My father eventually uh, took custody of us and my mother left and he raised us. From the time my sister was six months old until um, he died when I was 27. Mm. And uh, I grew up in a black neighborhood with a Chinese father in a Chinese household that was extremely patriarchal and misogynistic, to say the least. And um, as a young girl... I had to find my um, my place, and by finding that place, I always had to battle with my father or my brother, and it was a very difficult experience because I was the middle child, and of course, if anyone knows about a classically um, uh, Chinese household, they would know that children, there's a hierarchy in the household. My brother was the number one uh, son, and he, my father only had one son. He had two girls, and I was the middle child, so you would think that I would be the number one daughter, and that my sister would be the number two daughter. Unfortunately, some things happened in that household that um, put my rank all the way back to the number 100 daughter, which made my sister, who was younger than me, the number one daughter. And when I got the title of the number 100 daughter, literally, um... I just fought most of my childhood trying to win my father's approval and his affection and his confirmation that I was a good girl, but it never happened. So 
uh, from that experience, I decided that I needed to write about my experience. And I started writing a book. And what I named it was, what I titled it was The 100 Daughter. The number 100 daughter. And that's where that that's all where came from? That's where the number 100 daughter came from. Wow. So you're still, you're working on that book right now? I'm working on that book. I have about 300 pages of that book. I have not written in some time, but I have it on my mind all the time. And I would like to continue writing it. It would be a beautiful dream if I could continue to write it. I often thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I had a sponsor who could just sponsor my life, pay for my bills while I write this book. But of course, that's just a dream. Or is it? Well, you just never know what might take place. You never know when what you speak might take to the universe. Um, and I'm a believer of universal law that uh, the universe will give you what you need. I believe that too. You're listening to my interview with Mi Lin Yok, artist, writer, and retired American Airlines employee. Now back to the show. I knew a little bit about, you know, your childhood from working on a piece with you before right. about your family. I remember you talking about not too long ago about purpose and this um, about a bazooka, the bubblegum wrapper. And and that happened when you were how old? I was about maybe five years old. My father, who yelled a lot, and because he couldn't communicate, he didn't speak English very well. And so yelling was a part of my family, which him yelling and me being so young and fragile, I became muted. And I didn't open my mouth often unless it was some grievance I had with my sister or my brother, which was often. And I was pretty much, when they compared me to my sister, they would say, oh, my sister was the beautiful little girl. And then they would look at me and say, and that's the quiet one right there. So I got me some, uh, I used to chew bazooka bubble gum, and that was like the big thing back then. I remember, loved it. And I used to pile it up in my mouth, and then I realized that I was about maybe five or six, because I was able to, I was taught to read before I went to school. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading and seeing on the bazooka bubble gum, they used to have a little fortune at the bottom, like an advice thing mm -hmm. at the bottom. And I remember reading this bazooka bubblegum wrapper in the fortune. It said, never be afraid to ask for what you want. And from that day on, I used that fortune as a liberator for my voice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I ever shut up ever since that day. <laughs> What would you say is your gift? Well, I struggled um, in school with um, education mm -hmm. because my father was not interested in it because he couldn't he couldn't communicate in English. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, even though I don't always know um, the proper uh, grammatical. Uh, places, mm -hmm. which, you know, sometimes I struggle with, but I think that my greatest gift is writing mm -hmm. because the way that I communicate is so much different in the way than in the way that I write. Mm -hmm. I am much more detailed and much more reflective when I write and it's like a different voice. Mm -hmm. And I get lost into the words and the thoughts and and just the ability to express in that manner. Coming full circle to where you are now, 
all the things, the experiences that you have had in your life have brought to you to you now, to mm-hmm. the now. Mm-hmm. What are your hopes? Well, my hope is that I finish this book. Um, my hope is that I eventually retire where I don't have to have the stresses of survival anymore. Um, that I can pursue um, the passions of my heart, which is art. Mm-hmm. Um, be it writing, painting, sculpturing, photography. More with me, Lynn Yuk, coming up. The thing that I, um, which everyone heard, is that you can't make a living do art. Yeah. So that's like a consensus across the board. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I decided that, you know, my father was old. I needed to survive. I knew that he wasn't going to live as long as I would have wanted him to. So I knew that I had to like get serious about my future so that I, you know, would not be homeless because mm-hmm. being homeless was one of my haunts. Um, my father used to tell me that, you know, and this is a part of my book, that I would be out there saying, Mr. Mr. Give me a nickel. Mm-hmm. And that negative statement haunted me mm-hmm. and still haunts me. By the time I finished that job, $35 a week, by the time I finished and I got paid, I owed my father at least $25 of that money. Mm-hmm. And so I pretty much had only like 5 $10 out of a paycheck. And I would go to the movies because I did. it was a place to stay warm. And then I left and emancipated myself at 16 years old Mm -hmm. and um, left, got on welfare and got my own apartment. Mm -hmm. Lived there till I was 19. Mm -hmm. And then I came back home to the cold house Mm -hmm. and struggled in that environment. And then when my father died, I was 27 years old with a full-fledged addiction. I wrote a column on on that with that newspaper called Collage, mm-hmm. and it was a column that I was running every week, and I would write about addiction and, and the ills of the community, and the neighborhood people would come up to me and be like, "Oh, sister, that was real brown," because I did a big article about methamphetamine, mm-hmm. and uh, the drug addicts were coming up to me and said, "Wow, sister, that that article was powerful." And, you know, I was writing some pretty powerful articles. Then I left there and got me a construction job. And then from there, I worked for, I got out of that new non-traditional jobs training program, and I got a job with SEPTA. Mm -hmm. Then I dealt with racial discrimination and um, sexism. And then I got out of that job and... I didn't work for a while. I hustled on the street selling drugs with my addiction. And then I was helping one of the guys that was hustling with me find a job because he was, his woman, his girlfriend was having a baby. And I said, look, you need benefits. You know, I had a work ethic, even though I was a hustler. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the unemployment office and got him uh, was trying to get him an application. So I said, go look for the job you want. I'll stand in line and get you an application. Mm-hmm. And a guy came over to me from the unemployment office, and he's, I'm in the line, and he turns around, he says to all of us, you know, to me. But I didn't know he was talking to me. He says, you want to work? And everybody in the line turned around. And he looked at me because I had no intentions of working Mm because I was hustling. Mm -hmm. And I said, who, me? He said, yeah, you. Come on out. And he followed me. So I followed him back to the office. And he says, American Airlines is hiring. And they need to fill uh, a couple stones. 
they have a couple of positions they need to fill. They need a black woman, an Asian woman. <laughs> so I got hired under affirmative action. I went there with my beat up old van, my hustler clothes on, my toe sticking out of my loafers, and a couple bags of marijuana in my pocket. And he said, it was like 10 o'clock. He said, can you be there at 11 o'clock? I said, I'm going to do my best. So I told the kid, I said, listen, here's a dollar. You have to get the trolley home. I'm going to this interview. I get to the job interview, and I can hear the man in the background saying, this poor girl came all the way up here, but I'm afraid we're not going to hire her until he saw my resume. He saw that I worked for SEPTA as a maintenance mechanic. And he could not hire me. And I said to the man at the unemployment office before I left, I said, thank you. I said, thank God. And he said, you can thank me later. They sent me to do the physical. And then you didn't have to have a high school diploma. They didn't care if he was on marijuana because I had just did a doobie before I went to the, to the interview. And next thing you know, I was hired. Twenty-nine years and six months, I was laid off. I was 54 years old. I started the job, I was 24. Mm -hmm. And I had never been laid off before. Trust me, it wasn't an easy thing at that job because I had to do some things because I was experiencing the racism and the, and the, and the uh, sexism there as well. Mm -hmm. And then I got... I retired after a year. I was in, I was um, 54, but I couldn't retire, so I had to take the unemployment. Like what you hear? Subscribe, like it, and share this to whomever would appreciate it. I went to Capitol Hill, fought for our jobs, fought for unemployment. Oh yeah, I remember you. Yeah, were I went heavily I, involved. In yeah, it. and I was heavily involved in advocating for people who were unemployed, people who were being victimized by corporations, mm -hmm. and um, then I turned fifty-five, mm -hmm. and my unemployment was running out, and they weren't granting an extension, and then finally. I turned 55, and I decided that it was time to th throw in the towel. I got a pension, but it wasn't enough. So now I have three part-time jobs, and I'm having a hard time finding a full-time job at this age with not much skills, but I did go back and I got my behavioral health technician uh, certificate. And um, prior to leaving that job, while I was there, I got my high school diploma. I remember that, and I was so proud of you for doing that. I thought that was amazing. Thank you. You never gave up. I never gave up. I pursued my associate's degree, which is what I'm still trying to do. Um, I wanted to get go further than that, but, you know, I'm pushing up in age. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my bucket list is just to get a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like to pursue that. I'm um, studying um, liberal arts and behavioral science. And I, I'm a 3.50. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. And I was shocked. Because I wasn't a very good student growing mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. even though I had one guy say to me, he said, you were bad as hell, but you were smart. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, it always makes me feel good. Like what you hear? Subscribe, like it, and share this to whomever would appreciate it. I bought me a house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a very peaceful life. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm working with kids who were like me. Mm -hmm. Like you from what degree? Um, who have behavioral problems, who mm -hmm. have, um, you know, um, some internet, intellectual um, struggles mm -hmm. and um, behavioral struggles. I work as a paraprofessional in the classrooms, um, but I work on the bus. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I call my bus the learning bus. Nice. Because we learn, I teach those kids things that they don't learn in a classroom. Mm -hmm. I work with disabilities, mm -hmm. kids who have disabilities. Sure. And where systems have failed them. Mm -hmm. And I want to give back. I want to help a kid not have to experience the pain that I went through. I want them to know that there is a way to communicate mm -hmm. in spite of that pain. Mm -hmm. I just want them to know their voice, their true voices. What advice do you have? for people like me approaching retirement? Well, I say while you're working, um, it's important that you use your finances to save um, and to get all the things that you will need for the next part of your life. For me, I made sure that I had a full functional home, that there was no room that I could not go into and find something interested or interesting to do. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I'm in the middle room, I could look at TV or I can get on the internet. I can lay on the floor and, and do some yoga. You know, it's a serene room. I can stay in here and meditate. If I'm in the, um, if I'm in the back room, I can just read a book in the back room, you know, make your home functional in a place that you want to be because the world is not the same as it was mm -hmm. when we were in our thirties. It's not as friendly and it's not accessible to us. There are much more fears. You know, you do need to take added precautions in this day and time. It's not like, you know, you're going to run into a robber every 100 days, you know, you know, where now you're running into one every day. So the, the chances are you may be shut in. Mm -hmm. You may not want to go out. You may not feel safe. And as you get older, I'm finding my body don't move the same way. I can't run. My back hurts all the time. So I know that when I go out that house, I have to have a final destination. I can't just get in the car and just like move about the planet. Um... So those are the things that you have to consider. You need to consider making your home um, the place you want to be when you're not out there. Mm -hmm. At 50, you don't want to be around as many people. That's true. And yeah. the people that you are around, you want to be around them, but you only want to be around them for a certain amount of time. Right. <laughs> You know, before it used to be, oh, I could be around you forever, all day long. You know, now you're like, when are you going home? <laughs> or I'm going home. Sure. Because you need, if something happens at 50. You need your time alone. And okay. you actually enjoy it. The first year is the toughest year in sure. retirement. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because you feel like you're a waste. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're unproductive. You're useless. Mm -hmm. You're not producing anything. Mm -hmm. That was my first year where I just felt like I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing enough. Uh, so I recommend as soon as you retire, start um, hitting the pavement and trying to find a part-time job. Because if you don't, uh, depression can easily set in. I didn't get depressed, but I saw where it could have easily set in and started beating myself up mm -hmm. about not being uh, useful anymore. Mm -hmm. I wish that I had paid off my house mm -hmm. before I retired, but that wasn't realistic. Um, it was recommended that I do that, um, but it wasn't realistic for me in my situation because I needed all the money that I can get at the time that I needed it. Um, but it's not, I mean, my mortgage is inexpensive. If you have a high mortgage, I would recommend you pay your house off. Retiring is a beautiful thought, but it can be a very tough place to be if you're not applying yourself to jobs afterwards. Mm -hmm. The good thing about uh, having three part-time jobs is that I'm not threatened by losing one. The hardest thing I'm faced with now is trying to find some relevancy at this age mm -hmm. in my life. And I think that's with a lot of people. Yeah, and that makes me feel good that um, that 
I'm not the only one. No, you're not. At mm-hmm. this age, mm-hmm. because it makes me, okay, I'm right where I need to be. Mm-hmm. You know, even though this is a struggle and a conflict, it's not something mm-hmm. that is, um, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Sure. This is a reality for everyone at mm-hmm. this age. Mm-hmm. And that makes me feel mm-hmm. like, okay, I'm in, I'm, I'm in my right process. Mm-hmm. My desire is to be to the point where I don't have to worry so much about my struggle. Mm-hmm. That I could spend more time helping and advocating in some way of other people's struggles. Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, life is not what you have, it's what you give. I just wanted to say how grateful I am to have had the opportunity to sit down with me, Lynn Yook. As we age in the working force, the threat of being laid off before retirement never ceases. It's almost like in the eyes of big businesses, our value lessens. But I feel it is so crucial for us to know our worth. So no matter how old you are, there is so much you can still do. So don't quit. Dream big. Dream bigger. Because you are not done yet. I'm Nadine O, and this is the Over 50 You Are Not Done Yet show.